Father God, we come tonight and just thank you for this time that you've given us to come out to your house and to worship together. Father, we just ask you tonight to continue to be with those that are sick tonight. We ask you to continue to be with Janet and with Dolly and with Rhonda and just help them tonight and with Carol's sister tonight. We just ask you to touch them all. You heard our request this morning, Father. We just ask that you be with all these families and just help everyone, Father. There's so many needs that are out there and so many things going on that only you can help and only you can touch, and we just turn them over to you tonight. We ask you, Father, now to be with our service and just help us as we lift our voices to worship you openly with our whole heart, our mind, or soul tonight. Help us open ourselves to hearing what you have to say to us. As we prepare now for our offering, Father, we ask you to bless it and use it, Father. You know the needs and you know how to provide, and we just trust you for all things. We thank you tonight in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars
acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and then proclaim my God how great thou art then sings my soul God, praise 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 God, praise
Without you, I fall apart. You're the one who guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Your sins run deep. Your grace is more. Your grace is found. Is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. To teach my song to rise to you. When temptations come my way. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and savior. I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh, God, how I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. My one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Scripture goes with that. It goes, uh, the righteousness cries out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. Psalms 34, 17. Would you be free from your burden and sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing on Calvary's time. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in the life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. 
Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily the praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. can wash away my sin nothing but the blood of jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount i know nothing but the blood of jesus for my part in this i see nothing but the blood of jesus for my cleansing this my plea nothing but the blood of jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount i know nothing but the blood of jesus nothing can for sin atone nothing but the blood of jesus not of good that i have done nothing but the blood of jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount i know nothing but the blood of jesus this is all my hope and peace nothing but the blood of jesus this is all my righteousness nothing but the blood of jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount i know nothing but the blood of jesus in my robe of white i will fly away to that land so fair meet my jesus there it will be so grand when i get to that land in my robe of white i will fly away first i'll hear the trumpet sound then all saints be heaven bound we'll cross over jordan and white stop and view the other side there i'll see those holy hills and my mansion he has built i'm going to be the first in line to see my name in the book of life in my robe of white i will fly away to that land so fair meet my jesus there it will be so grand when i get to that land in my robe of white i will fly away
gonna be a wonderful time when I get to the other side. See my loved ones gone before. We'll depart from them no more. We'll be walking on streets of gold, surrounded by riches untold. When I look on Jesus' face, I know I'm saved by his amazing grace. In my robe of white, I will fly away to that land so fair. Meet my Jesus there, it will be so grand. When I get to that land, in my robe of white, I will fly away. Down here my burden's heavy And the road is rough and long Sometimes my feet gets weary And so slow But there's a brighter day a-coming Soon I'll step on heaven's soar and I won't have to worry anymore. Won't have to worry when I reach the other shore. All my troubles will be over. Goodbye. I'll see my Savior standing at the door. Then I hear him say, You're welcome. All your cares you left behind. And I won't. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. You might as well get used to Romans chapter 8. Go ahead and mark it there because we may be there parked here for quite a while. I don't know. Um, but tonight we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 8 verses 12 through 17. We're just going to move kind of right along with uh, the scripture here. And tonight we're going to be talking about our obligations. And, um, and kind of uh, just like I said, you know, Paul's really just going to be um, continuing on with where we left off this morning. There's, uh, and he's trying to make a point here. He's really trying to make a point with these people. And it's the same point that I think that uh, God wants us to get to. He's making, um, he keeps repeating himself over and over and over and over and over and over again, it seems like. And, and in a lot of ways, he really is. But there's a reason he's doing that is because he's trying to get this message across to these people. And the message that he's trying to get across is that the Holy Spirit is a requirement for our relationship with God. The Holy Spirit is not something that's just, ah, 
optional. It's not a, just an extra, an add-on, or just something that, 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 oh, it's a good idea. But the Holy Spirit is essential to our relationship with Jesus Christ, with our relationship with God. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity of God, and the Holy Spirit is the one that makes everything really possible. He's the one that draws us to God. He's the one that indwells within us and, and opens us up to receive all the things that God has for us. And, and so Paul really wants to make this point that the Holy Spirit is essential to not only to our salvation, but also to our walk with God. And, and because, I mean, we read it this morning, without the Holy Spirit, there is no walk with God. There is no relationship with God. The, the Holy Spirit has to be present. The Holy Spirit has to be active in our lives. And, and, you know, when we talk about being sanctified, we talk about sanctification, people say, well, hold on a minute. What about all this receiving the Holy Spirit? Well, I want to give you some, a, a different perspective on that just tonight because our receiving of the Holy Spirit is more uh, of our submission to the Holy Spirit than anything else. It's our submitting ourselves fully to the Holy Spirit, allowing the Holy Spirit to take full control of us. It's really what the receiving of the Holy Spirit is because the Holy Spirit is always there and the Holy Spirit is always active in our entire relationship with Christ. But like I said just a second ago, the Holy Spirit is who draws us to God to begin with. And without that Holy Spirit drawing us, what are we left with? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And Paul is trying to make this point. He's trying to get all this established with them because what we're going to get into tonight are some of the obligations that, that we as Christians really have and really should be doing. And, and he's established that necessity and now he's going to take it just a step further. And that's where we're going to pick up tonight in Romans chapter 8. I'm going to read verses 12 through 17. It says here, starting in verse 12, Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation. No, that's where I got the title from. That's a good place. Get it right from Scripture. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature, but it's to live, or to live according to it. Our obligation is not to the sinful nature. It's not to live according to it. It says, for if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. There's not a maybe, an if. It says, if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. He says, but if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Life and death. We'll get to that in a minute. He says, but cause those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God, sons and daughters of God, children of God. He says, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. He says, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. He says, Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in His glory. Pray with me. Father, we come and I thank You so much and praise You tonight. I ask You now to be with me and give me these words. I ask You to remove me from the equation and You just take over this place tonight and let Your will be done. We thank You for what You have done. We thank You for what we know You are capable of doing. We thank You for what You are going to do, Father. And we just praise You tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so now, like I said, it's, it, it seems like Paul's repeating himself over and over and over again, and really he is. He is repeating himself. And like I also said, the point he's trying to make is so important, he has to compete, continuously repeat himself over and over. He is trying to make the point that the work of the Spirit and the lives of the believer is necessary. And he's trying to make that point abundantly clear. And the reason he has such a hard time making it, he, that, making it so clear that he has to repeat himself over and over again is because the people that he's addressing are a lot like the people are today. A lot like the people are today. They're headstrong, self-willed, what is it, what's it called, stiff neck? I believe that's what, what, uh, what they're called in the Old Testament. Stiff neck, 
They're headstrong. They're self-willed. And they have a horrible, horrible, horrible time just submitting themselves to God. Just uh, humbling themselves before God and giving control of themselves over to God. They cannot. They have a hard time doing that because their mindset is they're not going to submit to nobody. Ain't nobody going to tell them what to do. Ain't nobody going to control them. Ain't nobody going to lead them, not even God. That was their mindset. Their, their motto was, ain't nobody my boss. Y'all ever heard that? You say, you ain't my boss. You can't tell me what to do. I ain't going, no. <laughs> I see smiles back there. <laughs> But that was their motto. You ain't my boss. Ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. And we have the same mindset too, to be honest with you. The same mindset. People are no different today than they were then. And they have that mindset that ain't nobody going to tell them what to do. Not even God. They are so stubborn, so self-willed, so headstrong. There's nobody's going to rule over them. And they get in their mind here that, that, that God is, is going to be so oppressive or something that if they submit themselves to God that they're going to be made to do things they don't like to do. That's crazy. Submitting yourself to God opens you up to God's victory in your life. It opens you up to all of God's blessings and all the things that God has in store for us. But we don't realize those things and we don't walk in the victory of God because we can't submit ourselves and listen to God. We've got to do it our way. We've got to do everything our way. We can't just submit and listen and do what God says. We want to do everything the way we want to do it. And we don't have victory because of that. We can't, we can't really understand this abundant life that Jesus talks about. We can't understand what it is to walk in the Spirit because we have to first submit ourselves to God. And we can't do that. We're so consumed with being right and getting our way that we disregard what God's trying to tell us and what God's trying to show us and how God's trying to lead us. <clears throat> and that's why Paul has to keep repeating himself over and over. I don't know, maybe that's why we have to keep going through this chapter over and over. I don't know. But he's, he tells them kind of, you know, he's kind of like, well, hold on just a minute. So that's your attitude, I've told you. But hold on, I'm going to tell you something else here. Because he's talked at length about the sinful nature. He's talked at length about the Spirit and living in the Spirit. And then he says this, this is where ours picks up. He says, Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. So, we have an obligation. Did you all know that? We have an obligation. An obligation. Think about it. What's an obligation? A duty. A requirement. He says, we have an obligation. He says, but it's not to serve the flesh. It's not to submit to our own sinful nature. It's not to walk and do whatever we want to do. That's not what our obligation is. So we're not obligated to ourselves. We're not obligated really to one another. To an extent. We're obligated to who? Help me. God. That's who we're obligated to. And, and, so, and so, okay, so we're obligated to God. Then what is that obligation? Exactly. To serve God. You remember we talked about, we kind of, I gave it away this morning. That obligation is to fulfill the great commandment. To go, to make disciples. To fulfill what God has told us to do. To love God with all of our heart, our mind, our soul. To love our neighbor as ourselves. And to do what God's calling us to do. That's, that's what our obligation is. It's just to love God and to love other people. And that's going to cause us to go and to make disciples. Is because out of the abundance of your heart, what the mouth speaks. Out of what's in your heart comes out of what you do and who you are. He says that's our obligation. We're obligated to God and we have to do that. So that's good, isn't it? Amen. That's the obligation. Everybody agree? That's our obligation. Raise your hand if you agree with me. That's your obligation. All right. Are you doing it? Are you doing it? Are you living up to that obligation? 
That's where it gets a little tougher, isn't it? It's a little tougher there. Are we living up to that obligation? Are we doing what Paul says in Ephesians 4? I think I preached over this one time. He says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Live a life worthy of that high calling which you've received. And, you know, we'll say, well, I don't know. I don't know if I am or not. I think I am. I think I'm doing what God says. Well, in verse 2, he tells us. Paul says this. He says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. So he says we're to be patient, humble, gentle, and bear with one another, love one another. Sounds a whole lot like those fruit of the Spirit, don't it? You know why? Because it is. It's the same thing. You see, Paul is consistent. That's one thing I get so aggravated. People say, well, it says one thing over here in the Bible and one thing over here. No, it does not. They may use different words for different audiences, but it says the exact same thing. I'm going to show you in the midst of the minute something that said all the way back in Deuteronomy, way over here. Uh, my, your page numbers are different than mine, but it's, a, it, it's over towards the front. And, and, and Paul's going to really say it again all the way over here in the back. It's consistent throughout from beginning to end because it's God's Word. And so we, we're obligated to follow God's Word and to do the things that are in God's Word. And we say, that's hard. It is. It's difficult. But it's not nearly as hard if we're walking in the Spirit. That's what makes it possible. You see, because as hard as it is, it's impossible without the Spirit. It is impossible without the Holy Spirit. Absolutely impossible. And that's why he's kind of going on. Because without the Spirit, we have no power. We're powerless over sin. We're powerless over our sin nature. We're powerless over the flesh. But Jesus says, this is Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on. And he also says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He empowers us to do all things. It's the power to overcome, the power to endure, the power to be the people that God has called us to be, the power to live a life worthy of our calling. It is only through the Holy Spirit that any of that's even possible. Only through the Holy Spirit. And just kind of like what we talked about this morning, it's only when we are allowing the Holy Spirit to be in full control. So again, I'm going to ask you the same question. Who's in control? You, your flesh, your sin nature, or the Holy Spirit? Who's in control? You're the only one that can answer that. I can't. I don't know. Because I see, lot, I'll be honest with you, I see lots of good people that are nice people, friendly as they can be, will give you the shirt off their back. But they don't have the Spirit. See, you can fake it for a while. But what happens when the pressure comes? When the hard times come? I'm not talking about when somebody cuts you off going down the highway. I'm talking about the real hard things of life. How do you respond then? Do you respond with the power of the Spirit or within yourself? That's kind of where, where the rubber meets the road. And all of us, every single one of us, nobody's immune from this. All of us are going to struggle from time to time. All of us. All of us are going to struggle with our walk, with submitting to the Spirit. And in those times... Those are the times kind of I think we get we feel like we're kind of stuck. We feel just kind of stuck. Well, guess what? The, through the Spirit, God can unstick us, can pull us out. But we've got to decide what we really want. If we really want to get unstuck, or if we want to stay stuck in the mud forever, we've got to decide. Because it's a choice. It's a choice. It really is. It's a choice. And Paul goes on here. And this is our choice here. It's, our choice is life or death. That's the choice. 
He says this in verse 13, For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. No ifs, ands, or buts. You will die. You will be destroyed. He says, But if by the Spirit you put to death the, the, the misdeeds of the body, you will live. You will live. And it kind of puts it in perspective of how important that choice is. Life or death really is what it is. Eternal life, eternal death. That's what it boils down to. Man, and I promised you, we're going to, I'm going to show you something in the Old Testament that says pretty much the exact same thing. It was written to a different group of people. Moses is relaying God's instructions to the people, but he's telling them the exact same thing. This is Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 through 20. I'm going to read you the whole thing, then I'm going to break it down a little bit. He says, See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways and to keep His commandments, decrees and laws. Then you will live and increase and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. He says, But if your heart turns away from away and you are not obedient and you are drawn away and bow down to other gods and worship them, He says, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. And he says, you will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. And that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Now, the situation here is they're getting ready to enter into the promised land, getting ready to enter into this, this land that God had promised them for, for generations. They were at the door getting ready to go in. And God tells him, he tells Moses, you need to go and tell these people there's some things they've got to watch out for. Life is not going to be very easy. And there's things they've got to be careful about. He says they can either choose life or they can choose destruction. They can choose blessings or they can, or they can choose curses. It's their choice to make. He said, but I'm going to tell you this, if you want to be blessed, if you want to, if you want to live in the promised land, if you, want to, if you want to cross over and live there, he says you will choose life. He says, and then choose life, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul. He says, you obey the Lord. You do what God says, basically. You are obedient. You fulfill your obligations to God. But then he says, if you don't, if you turn away from God, if you decide that you know, it, know a better way, that you're going to do it however you want to do it, that you're not going to listen to what God has to say, that your way is better, he says, you are, he says basically the only thing you're doing is you are destroying yourselves. He says you are calling down curses uh, on yourself because you are wandering from God, you're taking up false gods and idols, walking according to the flesh, the sinful nature, and you're cursing yourself. And he, he basically, he pleads with them here. He says, I command you. But he's saying, I command you. But he's saying, I'm pleading with you. Make the right choice. Choose God. Choose life. Choose prosperity. Choose His blessings. And it's, it's really, it's that simple. But I wonder though, how many people are sitting in church pews all over our land that their hearts have wandered from God. They're just kind of going through the motions there. Just kind of there. Week after week after week after week. Just sitting there. I don't even know why they're even sitting there, to be honest with you. Because most of the time what's going through their heads, I wish they would shut up so I can leave. Honestly. My thing is, Leave! You ain't doing yourself no good because you've turned yourself off to the Holy Spirit. You've turned yourself off to God. If you don't want to be there, leave. Unless you're underage and you can't leave. And you're stuck. What's that old joke? You used to have a drug problem. They drug me to church every time the doors was open. <laughs> That's good. Drag them to church every time the doors are open. That's how they learn something. But if you're an adult and you've made up your mind that you ain't going to listen regardless, what's the point? Go play in the rain. 
Because that's you're going to get more good out of it. Take some soap, you get a good bath out of it, save you some money. That's about as much good as you're going to get out of it, honestly. But people's heart have turned from God. Uh, Jesus says that he's, uh, he's quoting Isaiah but he says this in Matthew 15 he says these people honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from me he says they worship me in vain their teachings are but rules taught by men they're good at following all the rules that they make up but their hearts so far away from God it don't make a bit of difference and I'm going to tell you, if anybody is here tonight and you're like that, why? Why? Why do you continue to live that way? Why do you continue to do that? This path leads nowhere but to destruction, to death and destruction. And I'm going to tell you the same thing that Moses told the Israelites, that this day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to His voice and hold fast to Him. For the Lord is your life. The Lord is your source of life. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The Lord is your life. Without the Lord, there is no life. It's an illusion. He says that he will give you many years in the land that he swore to give your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now our promised land isn't the land of Israel. Our promised land is heaven. Our promised land is eternity. And many years is forever. If we choose life. If we choose life. And he tells us this. And this is the encouraging part. Remember I said every kind of passage, Paul gives you kind of some encouragement. He says, though, this is verse 14, those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. And that's not just the fellas, the children of God, the sons and daughters of God. Think about that. That's how much God cares about you. You are a child of God. If you have accepted Jesus Christ, you are God's child. And you have full access to the full measure of God's power. You realize that? God holds nothing back from you. You have access to it all. All you have to do is take what He's offering. That's it. And then He says this, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by Him we call Abba, Father. So here's the thing. If you are struggling, don't live a life of fear. Don't be afraid. God has not given you the spirit of fear, but a power and of a sound mind. Don't live a life of fear. God, it says, God has made you, does, uh, the spirit that made, for you did not receive a spirit that made you a slave again to fear. He's trying to get my words all twisted there. You did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by Him we cry, Abba, Father. And if, you, if you're afraid, then call out to God. Call out to your Father. Call out to Abba. Pray. If you don't know what to say, don't worry about it. Because at the end of that chapter, he says this, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't even know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance to God's will. And then go back to our passage in verse 16. It says, The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And God will never abandon His children. God will never leave us. God will never forsake us. He will never go away from us. So, if you're struggling with anything, give it to God. And let God take it. Let God have it. Let God take control over it. And here it is. I'm going to end with this. He says in verse 17, If we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in His sufferings in order that we may also share in His glory. You realize that? That's how much God cares for you. 
that you are an heir to the kingdom of heaven. Co-heirs with Christ. That's how special you are to God. To let Satan lie to you and tell you all this other junk. It's all lies. You are an heir to the throne of the kingdom of heaven. Think about that. Think about that. But only if Jesus is your Lord and your Savior. Only. Through the power of the Spirit. So that's what I want to do tonight. I'm not going to take a lot of time, but I do want to give you an opportunity to pray. I'm going to get Michelle to put on some music back there. And I would encourage you to spend some time reflecting and praying. You can pray at your seat. You can come up here and pray. But to just quiet your spirit and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. So if y'all just bow your heads and as she plays the music back there, you all just be obedient to God tonight. Father, we come one more time and I thank you tonight. I thank you for the obedience of those that came to the altar tonight, Father. I thank you for all the obedience of those that prayed at their seats tonight, Father. And I just ask that you uh, open us each and every one up to what you have for us. Open our eyes, our hearts, our ears, Father. Help us to see, hear, and understand what your will is, Father. And help us to have the courage, Father, to carry that will out. Help us, Father, to fulfill the obligations that you've given us and help us to be the Christians that you've called us to be. Guide us this week, be with us, and keep us safe and bring us back. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.